one for mum, one for dad, and one for the country. And there has never been a more exciting time to be an Australian. Budgets are about choices, Fran, and you show what you value through the choices you make. This is coal. Don't be afraid. The Don't be scared. The the treasurer knows. I want an economy that works for people, not the other way around. We'll just end up being a third-rate economy. You know, Republic. Just follow the money. G'day. And welcome to Follow the Money, the Australia Institute's podcast that explains big economic issues in plain English. I'm Ebony Bennett, Deputy Director at the Australia Institute, and today's episode is part of our special Follow the Money Summer Series, where we'll be bringing you some of the best conversations from our popular webinar series. Australian governments have committed to tackling the twin climate and biodiversity crises, But on the other hand, they do continue to subsidise and approve new fossil fuel projects and habitat destruction. While simple policy solutions do exist, governments are instead relying on overcomplicated market-based solutions to conceal the fundamental contradiction between support for fossil fuel production and promises to save the environment. Will Green Wall Street save us? Probably not. Today, you'll hear our Executive Director, Richard Dennis, and Senior Researcher, Polly Hemming, who simplify the complexities of nature-based markets and debunk myths around offsets and environmental markets. This was recorded live on Wednesday, the 23rd of November, 2022, and things may have changed since recording. So you might have missed it at the time, given all the news that's been around, um, especially given how many climate and environment announcements that we've had in the second half of this year. But back in August at the G20 Environment Ministers meeting, that was in Bali, I believe, Environment Minister Tanya Plibersek said something that had a few of us and probably a few of you scratching your heads ever since. It wasn't long after the well overdue and devastating State of the Environment report had been released. Um, And if you need a quick recap of that, things are bad in the environment, (laughs) to put it mildly. Australia's ecosystem, that's right, yeah. (laughs) Australia's ecosystems are uh, in many respects collapsing thanks to either climate change, habitat loss, invasive species, pollution, mining, land clearing, all kinds of things. Um, And to world leaders, Minister Plibersek suggested that Australia could potentially reverse this environmental crisis uh, and the same crisis being faced by other countries with or by creating what she called a green Wall Street um, or a trusted global financial hub where the world comes to invest in environmental protection and restoration. Now, I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with the history of Wall Street, but this didn't exactly inspire me with confidence, nor was I really very sure what it actually meant. Um So I think that's a good question for us to explore today. And I'm a little bit worried about uh, making Wall Street uh, kind of our aim with this. But we are increasingly hearing business and government throwing around a lot of terms like nature-based solution, nature capital, green economy, to to words that we already hear um, around climate, like climate finance, net zero, carbon markets, and all those kinds of things. And if you've been following the COP27 UN climate conference last week, you probably could have played buzzword bingo with a few of those terms. So speaking of COP, um, it's against that backdrop of climate and biodiversity crises that we were so starkly reminded of last week that we really wanted to dive into this topic today in some more detail. What is Green Wall Street? What are environmental markets? Are they good policy when it comes to climate and biodiversity? Can we save the environment and get rich at the same time? It sounds too good to be true. Joining me to unpack it all today is Executive Director of the Australia Institute, Dr. Richard Dennis, specialist in exposing jargon and econobabble, <laughs> and our Senior Researcher in the Climate and Energy Program, Polly Hemming. Polly has a background in government, education and science communication, and she's really been key in driving Australia's national conversation around greenwashing and carbon markets. And Richard, I'm sure many of you are familiar with, uh, he's a regular guest and has spent the last 20 years 
moving between policy focus roles in academia, federal politics, and as head of the Australia Institute. Um, he's one of Australia's best economists. So I'm delighted to be joined by both of you today. Thank you. Before we start, um, I know I've kind of alluded to the state of the environment re report and things being pretty bad there, but in terms of climate, I guess, after COP, where are we at with Australia's emissions? Are they falling? No. no, no. <laughs> yeah. Well, technically, if we count actual emissions, we only emitted 1.8% less than we did in 2005. So they, they've gone up, flatlined, gone down a wee bit then gone up a bit more yeah, thanks no so no no <laughs> no, no we haven't not no, decarbonizing no. our economy okay so but chris bowen's been telling us that australia is back um when it comes to climate how accurate is that as a statement oh still the world's third largest fossil fuel exporter with exciting plans to get bigger soon Ooh, yep. lots of gas lots of coal um look uh, we're transitioning our energy market Old coal-fired power stations are falling over through old age, which is great. We're replacing them with renewables, but we're doubling down on coal and gas, and that's what's going to drive our emissions up, the resources sector. Well, not just doubling down on it, also continuing to subsidise it yeah. with, you know, well, $11 billion in the last financial year. So, yeah, you're right, decarbonising electricity, but transport emissions going up, mining emissions going up, emissions from gas for export going up. And still logging native forests in Tasmania. Bob Brown arrest, arrested, you know, for trying to stop native forest logging while we're saying we're trying to create a market for nature. Okay. So that, yeah, that's a nice picture of kind of where things are at at the moment. Uh, and Sounds like still not really great when it comes to reducing emissions. Um, so Green Wall Street and this idea of nature-based markets and all of that, there's quite a lot of jargon in how the minister and others have been talking about this, but it feels like something that we need to keep pretty simple. I mean, Polly, what is, what is going on here? What is Green Wall Street for a start? So... So I, I won't start off sounding so tired. Um, <laughs> you've, you've just, it's really good that you set the scene there. Emissions aren't going down. Land clearing is still um, happening rampantly. Uh, we're not decarbonising. Government is still not regulating industry adequately. We're still subsidising and approving fossil fuels. But at the same time, um, the Labor government um, was elected and this State of the Environment report landed in its lap and so it has to be seen to be doing something. And rather than actually regulating the industries that are doing this damage, because uh, apparently that's not even an option or, or not subsidising them, the idea is that we'll let the market take care of this. So it's really, it's not new, but it, like uh, Minister Plibersek said, oh, the government can't afford to do this alone. That was how she sort of premised this whole idea of Green Wall Street. Uh, really what it is, is it's, it's about, sort of shrinking democracy, taking this away sort of out of the public sphere and just letting the market take care of it, um, which has worked so well. Uh, yeah, in with so many other areas. With other public goods. Yeah. yeah. Childcare, aged care, disability care. Yeah, but Never. Richard, <laughs> yeah, this idea of nature being a market and refashioned as the idea of natural capital the, the the idea that nature is money basically um how does that work is is that going to work no um so <laughs> the end. goodbye everyone <laughs> <laughs> there, there's a the take out message this stuff's nonsense look let's be clear there's nothing to stop uh woodside or uh, Rio Tinto or BHP going and buying a whole bunch of land right now and planting a whole bunch of trees right now and protecting some nature. If they wanted to do that last year or 10 years ago or tomorrow, great. But you know what? They haven't. They never have. I wonder why. Maybe they thought their job was to maximise profits from you know expanding fossil fuel production. So all this market stuff, what we're saying now is that as Polly said, rather than the government, which can afford $250 billion worth of stage three tax cards, but says it couldn't afford a billion dollars or two to you know, protect our endangered species, of course it could afford to if it wanted to, rather than the government step in, regulate to stop old growth logging, stop subsidising fossil fuels or stop land clearing in Western New South Wales, 
what we've done is created a market where Woodside or Santos, who could have protected nature of their whole career and chose to harm it instead, uh, where what they can now do is expand their fossil fuel production as long as someone else promises to sequester some carbon. But but just st- stepping back a bit, like to answer that question about sort of more broadly, where is this coming from? It's it's sort of the idea that everything has to be couched in economic terms because uh, governments make policy according to to economics. And so if you then, this this is sort of by proponents and, and government and a lot of um, NGOs and, and other groups have sort of bought into this idea that nature is capital, nature is money, as you said, Eb, and so we need to account for it in economic terms. And yes, that the, the markets come into that, but it's bigger than that. Mm. Like we do talk about natural capital and and climate finance and stuff. And the idea is that it's it's investable and it can make a profit at the same time as sort of um, saving us environmentally. So it's it's a it's a broader kind of um, narrative and markets are one part of that. Mm. Richard, I was just going to ask you, cause I know you've spoken about it or written about it in a couple of your books previously, but this idea that, you know, economics struggles to value some things is nature. One of those things, how hard is it well, to put a price on saving a koalas basically? Well, it, it's, it's easy as long as you don't mind being wrong. <laughs> like pick a number, you know, is a koala worth a hundred bucks, a thousand bucks, a million bucks. We could pick numbers. You could, I could, the minister could. When we say let the market fix it, what we're doing is we're saying, well, let's let Santos or Woodside decide how much it's worth. But to be clear that when we have these markets for carbon or markets for koalas or markets for nature, the the driving force is not to protect the climate or to protect the koala. The driving force is I want to expand my fossil fuel production or I want to clear some land so I can do a property development where the koalas live. So the reason that companies that never voluntarily went and spent their shareholders' money protecting nature are now saying, oh, please, let's create a market so I can protect nature is that this whole idea of offsetting is if I'm allowed to expand my carbon pollution, if Polly promises to sequester some pollution, well, I'll pay Polly some money to do that. But to be clear, I'm not valuing the climate or I'm not valuing a koala. I'm valuing the profits that I get from expanding. Yeah. And so what we've really now said to the fossil fuel industry is if you want to expand so that you can make more profit, you have to go pay someone to do some good. Now, there's lots of moral problems there. There's lots of ethical problems there. But there's a fundamental economic problem here. And that is that the cheapest solution for the fossil fuel industry is to find someone who's willing to lie or exaggerate. And I'm looking at you, Polly, but, lie or exaggerate how much they're, they're going to yeah. save. But this is not how any of it's pitched. Like no. you've unpacked <laughs> all of it. But But again, starting... From, from this premise, where is it coming from? It, we've actually got a slide. I know this is not usual um, webinar format, but but I just want to demonstrate sort of how this is being uh, pitched to the public and to investors um, and to, to environmental groups, sort of the way it's being framed. Like no one is actually saying we're setting up this market so Woodcut, Woodside can, play, can keep polluting. It's, it's framed in a much more uh, sort of, prosperous and and promising way so is is that slide up now yeah so we've got some of the headlines that you can see here um nature credits could make australia the green wall street for the world tanya plibersek says blue carbon will be the next frontier of carbon crediting uh yeah those are those are the headlines yeah so that's it's nature-based solutions It's, it's natural capital it's green economy it all sounds uh amazing like it's something that i'd want to invest in notwithstanding that I don't really know what it means, which is, but that's <laughs> partly why it works so well um, because no one really does, but you don't want to admit that. So I just kind of wanted to to take it really high level. This is this is the way it's being promoted at COP. This is the way it's being promoted by, you know, big climate investment firms. Um, and and then, yes, of course, we hone in on on what Green Wall Street actually is and it, it is the biodiversity and carbon markets. Yeah, so. and so the next slide that we've got here is the species prospectus. <laughs> I love this. Um, about how we're going to save, I think, the mahogany glider. 
Yeah, so I just wanted to to really demonstrate that this is not new thinking. This is the idea of um, the environmental accounting and the green economy has been around since the 70s. We didn't call it nature-based solutions then. We called it, uh, well, they called it, I'm far too young, called it <laughs> ecosystem services. And actually the idea was just to demonstrate that if you did de development or anything that, that caused damage, it would uh, risk those ecosystem services like flood mitigation and, and carbon sequestration and things like that. Problem is someone then said, whoa, if we, could, if we sell these ecosystem services, then uh, we can make a buck at the same time as saving the environment. So it's not a new conversation internationally, definitely not a new conversation in Australia, these idea of environmental markets trading these ecosystem services or, or sort of privatising. Um, we had water markets in the 80s. Um, the carbon market has been around um, since 2012-13. Productivity Commission wrote a report in 2002 called Environmental Services and Environmental Markets. Then I wanted to get to this gem, which like, this isn't even the sophistication of a market in 2000, I think 17 or 18, the, the coalition said, we'll just put out a prospectus called a threatened species prospectus and we'll, and it's an innovative new funding model. We'll just invite people to give us money for the environment. And that's what you can find that prospectus online. That's what that is. It's basically just saying, not, we can't afford to spend money on the environment, but we're not going to. And so we need people to partner with us to save the mahogany glider or all these, these other things. So it's absolutely not a new idea. And, and the reason why I guess I wanted to have that slide showing how this is all pitched is because it's pitched as these markets are nascent or this is this could save the world. It hasn't been given a chance. It's just too young, which is fundamentally not true in the same way that you know carbon capture and storage proponents always say, if it's given a chance, if it scales up, mm. it could work. It's It's been given a chance and fundamentally it hasn't worked. So what is new here is that we have a whole lot of people in the finance sector realising they could make a lot of money. Um, government doesn't want to keep funding environment, so it's great for them to promote it. But you also have uh, environmental groups thinking that what I see is the biggest trap is that economics is the only viable language. Like that's the language of power. So we have to speak the language of power ultimately every time they lose though. Um, and of course the urgency is as now increased. You have so many problems, climate, biodiversity, indigenous livelihoods. Wouldn't it be great if we had this solution that can solve all those problems at once and lo and behold, nature-based solutions and natural capital are the way to do that. Mm. And Richard, I mean, you've already touched a little bit on the limitations of that kind of an approach, but Polly, you tweeted about it, this idea that a developer could kind of log koala or sugar glider habitat in one area, but then offset by paying 600 bucks to save a koala somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And somehow that. Yeah. And that's out. literally what we're doing. We're, we're saying it's okay to do harm whether it's to the atmosphere or uh, to a species or to a habitat, it's okay to do harm as long as someone else does some good. So, and we, and you know, we've got, as Polly said, this sort of bizarre idea of a nature market. Well, let's, let's put it slightly differently. Let's say we wanted to have a community market, right? We wanted to improve the community in Australia. So Eb, you were going to harm some part <laughs> of the Australian I'm going to go out and start bar fight. <laughs> More harm, I should more, say. Harm, more, yeah. harm, more bar fights. And as long as Polly promises to not start any bar fights, we'll, we'll call it even. Yeah. This That's is an avoided grand, violence credit. An avoided <laughs> violence credit for the for the practitioners out there. I can actually see the so-called aggregators getting excited about this idea. So, you know, so the, the, the sort of ethics of this are bizarre, but even clearer, the economics of this are bizarre. Um, if we're trying to stamp out smoking across Australia, we don't say, oh, it's falling in one group, it's rising in another group, so we'll call it even. Like if we were trying to suppress smoking across the community, we would try to suppress smoking across the community. Uh, so, yeah, the, the economics of this are bizarre and the idea that, when we already know that we already have a shortage of koala habitat, that we would let a property developer destroy some of what remains of our koala habitat as long as someone else promises 
to plant some trees and hopefully over time the koalas will hang out in them like all of the risk is on the koala here like let's let's be clear that these offsets if the if the promises are broken we have no way to go back and unscramble this omelet egg is it is it worth at that point just explaining sort of what these markets i think are? so so we're talking about that as i said this whole sort of framing of, of natural capital uh, is broader, but within it and, and what is relevant to Australia are these two things called the carbon market and the biodiversity market. And uh, the carbon market, um, well, they're, they're similar things, but sort of trying to achieve different things. Like the, the carbon market wants to reduce emissions and biodiversity market wants to wants more habitat. Um, they're both market-based solutions. Um, they both concern sort of free trading of, of a commodity between um, private actors rather than government, although to be clear, it's government that is kind of has created the whole market. This is not something that has arisen because there was a demand. The, the government is channeling demand by saying developers have to offset or um, if you've polluted too much, you have to buy carbon credits to, to neutralise your, your pollution. So, Sorry, um, I'm just going to yeah. interrupt there. Mm. I've got one um, question here in the chat about the difference between offsets and carbon credits. Yeah, Can you just outline absolutely. that for that's, us, that's Billy? That's what I was going to get to. So in Australia, we have this carbon market, we have a scheme where the Australian government issues carbon credits to projects who have reduced or avoided emissions. So they might do that by uh, very rarely actually planting trees. And more often than not, it's just not cutting trees down or capturing landfill gas. And you carry out these activities according to certain rules that are known as methods. Um, and once you show the government that you've carried out this activity according to certain rules, they will give you a carbon credit. The carbon credit represents a reduction. And in Australia, what's weird is you either sell that credit back to the government and that sort of helps us nominally meet our climate target. That's what it's meant to do. Or you sell it to a business who is continuing to pollute, but they need to cancel out their emissions. So a like Energy Australia emits a tonne of CO2. They purchase a carbon credit, which represents a reduction and in theory, someone's reduced emissions over here so it's okay for them to to emit that extra ton so a credit just represents a reduction in the same way a biodiversity credit represents an increase in in habitat somewhere the credit itself is not the problem it's what it's used for and and when you start sort of talking about people making profits from them that's when these things start to get rorted so yeah the, the credit just represents that that activity has taken place. Biodiversity offsets. So the, we'll have this federal biodiversity market that, that Minister Plibersex flagged, and that is going to be based on the Australian carbon market, which is incredibly concerning for a lot of reasons. We have state-based biodiversity offset schemes, uh, I think in every state in Australia, and not really a market. Uh, New South Wales has these biodiversity credits like the, the koalas habitat credit you talked about otherwise what you can do is what a developer does is that they have a development proposal they say we're going to clear this much land the government says well if you're clearing that much land that has this species on it this ecosystem on it this habitat then you need to compensate that compensate for that in some way you either can just pay into a fund and government will sort of work out how to compensate or you carry out an activity yourself that compensates for it or you buy one of these biodiversity credits that's kind of how the two markets work yeah. there's there's one fundamental difference is that carbon is one commodity and we have already seen widespread fraud in the carbon market we don't even know whether most carbon credit projects actually store or avoid carbon yeah we might think come to about, that in just a yeah, second think about how bananas that gets that's happened with one commodity just carbon or carbon dioxide biodiversity is bazillions of things it's it's a whole functioning ecosystem the, the hint is in the name Richard as you always say how do you make that how do you make that one fungible trading unit hmm. yeah how do you get the diversity so like, everything I agree with everything Polly just said here's another way of thinking about it you the credits are issued for people who've done something good or who claim to have done something good under the rules. Yeah. So let's assume all the credits are legit, which they're not, but let's assume they're all legit. Credits are fine. Yep. Credits are paying a way to incentivize landholders to, you know, look after their land. 
arguably a very complicated way. Complicated to do it, way. Yes, yeah. Could just government could have more national parks, not complicated. Could ban old growth logging, or not complicated. Pay farmers, pay farmers some cash to do something good, not complicated. But imagine we didn't want to do anything simple. We wanted to create a way for the finance sector to profit while we're doing it. So we create all these credits as a way to incentivize people to do a good thing. So if though, and let's just focus on carbon dioxide and, you know, here are some trees that grew and secured a ton of carbon. And here was a forest that was about to be chopped down that was saved that secured a ton of carbon. That's good. No problem with those credits. The dangerous stuff is when, because we've created a credit, we'll let Polly have a debit. And that is she'll pollute more. She'll open a new coal mine. She'll open a new gas mine, a new coal mine. And then we'll say, but we'll call it evens. So credits are fine. They're not well, great. Yeah, but particularly because the idea is we're supposed to be reducing, reducing all these harmful things, exactly. reducing emissions, reducing habitat loss. Right. That is supposed to be the aim. Exactly. So it's the use of credits. And this is complicated. So I'm, I'm mm. glad someone asked the question. It's the use of credits, which are kind of fine, maybe unnecessary, but not the problem. It's the use of credits as an offset by people who are doing harm. So if we were paying money to people to plant trees that some koalas might live in and the koalas didn't show up, oh, well, we wasted a bit of money. But if we're paying someone to plant some trees that the koalas might live in to legitimize Polly destroying a, a habitat koala, where they actually live, this yeah. is horrible. Yeah. This is unfixable. This is wrong and it's not good for the economy. So it's the use of credits as offsets. I can't stress this enough that that's the problem. Yeah. So Polly, just sticking with that idea for the moment, if the objective is to reduce emissions, if the objective is to reduce habitat loss, this should be a last resort. Is it a last resort or is it the first thing that business goes to when they're about to do some harm? So this is the fundamental problem. I mean, even the our carbon offset scheme was only meant to be a very small part of our, our climate policy. And the idea is with any kind of offsetting, you have this um, avoid, reduce sort of you know hierarchy where you meant to avoid the damage in the first place, do everything you can to, to minimise harm, and then offsetting of any kind is is as a last resort. Of course, that is not how it's happening. We are having Woodside's gas developments approved in WA, that's by the state government uh, it, or, or the EPA, because they are proposing offsetting a small amount of their emissions. And, and that's the other thing that Richard was, was I think, getting to is that even if these credits did represent what they're supposed to, some hab habitat restoration or, or avoidance, um, which is a problem that that I'll talk about, but no one, A, not all developments have to offset their damage. Um, not all big gas projects have to offset all their emissions. Uh, you can make a claim of being carbon neutral gas company because you've offset your offices. So even if these credits were legitimate, no one is proposing offsetting the entirety of the damage that they're causing. So you just offset a fraction and the result is still more emissions or more clearing. Um, that That's kind of the problem. They're now being used to justify worsening things, not uh, we've done everything we, we can. can. And, and not only do we have this crediting scheme, but we also have government throwing a whole lot of money to environmental restoration and um, and resourcing it and, and policy alignment there. This is our only climate policy. Literally, carbon credits are pretty much the linchpin of our, of our climate policy. <laughs> and that brings me to our last slide and some of the problems that have been identified with the integrity of this market in particular. Um, Polly, can you tell us about some of the integrity questions that are now being raised and, and the review that's underway at the moment? Yeah, yeah. And and this slide is really to show sort of the, the flip side to all those really promising, alluring headlines about, you know, natural capital is, is a boom industry or, or whatever. For every one of those headlines, there's another headline that says, you know, land clearing has tripled in New South Wales over the last decade. Decade, 22 football fields worth of clearing was 
happened in Queensland in one year alone. And, and this is why I'm glad you had sort of that upfront because we now, we, we can see with our eyes, like the evidence is emissions aren't reducing, land clearing is increasing, where our ecosystems are collapsing. We have that evidence, but, and we also are seeing manifest problems with these markets or these schemes. So the, the emissions reduction fund um, has failed to reduce emissions. There's evidence that it's increasing emissions. Um, it, it only ever generated 117 million tonnes roughly of, of emissions reduction anyway, which is less than a third of, of Australia's emissions just for one year. Um, it's currently under review. Its governance is under review, yet we're put, forging ahead with a whole new federal biodiversity market. Off the back of that, state schemes have have failed, Auditor Generals have done, have carried out reports. Like they, they've just been a, a manifest failure and and offsetting never either reduces emissions or increases habitat. It only ever best best case maintains sort of flatlining or maintains decline. And there's a lot of academics who've written about biodiversity offsetting and the and the how that the entire model is flawed because it only ever maintains decline. So we're just gonna go to questions from the audience very shortly. But Richard, um if we wanted to do better, what are some alternatives <laughs> that we could do? Oh, well, look, I mean, the, the problem is we're, we're letting the econobabble of carbon markets and biodiversity markets conceal simple truths. If we wanted to reduce emissions in Australia, this is a giant if, if we wanted to reduce emissions in Australia, we should stop approving things that would cause emissions to go up. This is not complicated. If you were trying to phase asbestos out in Australia, you wouldn't approve a new asbestos mine. And you certainly wouldn't approve a new asbestos mine as long as someone built a mask factory. Yeah. Right. This is this is crazy stuff. So if we wanted to reduce emissions, we should stop approving things that will increase emissions. We should stop subsidies to things that increase emissions. We subsidise fossil fuel extraction, we subsidise fossil fuel use, and we subsidise native forest logging. And then if we stopped approving new things and we stopped subsidising harmful things, we should then use the power of regulation to stop people who are still clearing land that we don't want cleared. We don't actually have to pay people to tell them to not clear land. We can actually tell them to not clear land. Yeah. Now, we might want to pay compensation, we might want to pay them to spend money to really make their land conducive to restoration. But again, there's all these simple things we could do. And the problem is that uh, the green Wall Street stuff, the green capital stuff, uh, and, and frankly, the greenwashing by the government and increasingly parts of the climate movement that are saying, look, we can all get rich while we're tackling climate change. Just don't ask any awkward questions. All of this... Uh, sort of new narrative, new language is just concealing simple analysis of, of what's taking place. So if we wanted to reduce emissions, we could do uh, what Europe's doing, indeed what large parts of America are doing. We could be investing far more in renewable energy. We could be investing far more in public transport. We could be investing far more in energy efficiency. Like We know this stuff. But because everyone's now got excited about offsets and Mark, look, there's no pressure at the moment. Where's the campaign to increase the renewable energy target? Where's the campaign for a big increase in, in battery storage? Where's the campaign for a massive increase in public transport? Where's the campaign for the electrification of buses? Oh, don't worry, Richard. Green capital, carbon market, offset. The, uh, just just to add to that, um because it is important to talk about solutions. I did, did have a couple of things that I wanted you to answer for people because it's a question I had for you. But these this this sort of solution has come about because apparently the, the old way of protecting the environment or reducing emissions has failed. To be clear, no one ever tried the old way. <laughs> like even though we had the EPBC Act or we have sort of very loose regulations, not even those were implemented. Like we, we have fenced off large tracts of, of national park but they haven't been subsequently resourced to to protect or or ma maintain that land. The the old ways that didn't work have never actually been tried. The regulation, direct incentives, and and just adequately managing things mm. sounds simple and therefore boring, but <laughs> they actually work. And and I do want to talk more about solutions maybe at the end after some questions. But but Richard, I want you to answer this question like. 
A, who's buying, who's the market for this? Mm. And everyone always argues that you need to put a price on nature. Tell, can you explain? Because that was something that you and I talked about quite yeah. a lot. So to be clear, as I said at the outset, nothing has ever stopped Santos from buying land and looking after it. They just haven't for some reason. They've put all of their... Just not to. They put their money into making enormous profits from gas instead. Now, there are wonderful organisations in Australia that have been buying land and restoring it and protecting it for years. And and you know what? Again, Woodside and Santos weren't giving them hundreds of millions of bucks saying, keep up the great work, love what you're doing there. So we've always known how to pay people to look after nature and and well-meaning people, myself included at times, have donated to exactly these sorts of uh, land protection funds that literally buy land. Who's buying all the offsets are people that want to do some harm. And they're not... They're not doing it just for PR reasons. They're doing it because the law now says we've created these markets. It's okay to expand my harm because I bought an offset. So the reason that money is flooding into this nature capital market stuff, the reason the money is now flooding in is not some upwelling <laughs> of, yeah. you know, now it's finally time to, you know, plant some trees. It's, oh, I just got to spend a little bit of money doing this and I can make a lot of money doing that. So the economics of this make perfect sense for the polluters, but for for people, you know, in, including people that are profiting from 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 selling these credits to pretend that all of the money flooding in is from people that want to transition away from fossil fuels. I can't stress this enough. You won't have a growing market for carbon credits. You won't have a growing demand for carbon credits if you don't have growing emissions. If we were transitioning away from fossil fuels, we'd be predicting the carbon market would collapse. Yeah. The reason we're predicting all this growth in demand for carbon credits is because we're predicting enormous amounts of new sources of pollution. And sorry, just one last thing. We've got this, you know, the next year the government will introduce its so-called safeguards mechanism, which is the only climate policy this government has proposed. And it's built entirely around the idea that it's okay for new coal and new gas to open as long as there's some new offsets. And, and yeah, this has no, got nothing to do with good economic design and policy. It's just a good political solution to a government that's got some climate ambition that doesn't want to upset the gas industry. Well, how about we kind of make everybody happy through offset? Uh, I'm going to go to questions from the audience now. Thank you very much for all of your questions. Um, Chloe Mason asks, does the minister's hype about green capital come from a department hollowed out over the last decade <laughs> by serving a neoliberal <laughs> government? No, I know Chloe. Richard's written a lot about neoliberalism, but I'm, I'll put that to both of you. Yes. <laughs> I mean, I mean that, yes. <laughs> I, I mean, I think it goes back but before the coalition to be to be clear i think it it's never been a priority you know um even things like what i referred to the the national reserve system which which sounds great you protect a whole lot of land but not adequately resourcing it um but yes of course it, that was one of the things i was going to going to mention as solutions is that the the entire public service has been completely hollowed out so you don't have anyone administering these um, these programs you don't have anyone even helping uh, indigenous rangers someone was saying to me the other day they can't find anyone in the department to help them fill out a contract like you need to have you need to restaff your entire department climate and environment so you can administer programs adequately stop getting consultants who are going to say what you were going to do anyway um, but also have have actual expertise and content knowledge within mm. those departments. I think and, it's a really good point. Yeah, and I'll, I'll go further, not just hollowed out, but corrupted. Um, when the Australia Institute put out research questioning the integrity of a lot of these credits, right, so people promising to chop down trees that were never going to chop them down, getting paid a lot of money to do nothing. Uh, when we first made these uh, revelations, the, the regulator, the clean energy regulator, actually had a go at us. They didn't say, oh, wow, okay, better have a close look at that. Thank you for doing our job for us. Let's get to the bottom of this. From a regulator, flat denial. Similarly, when some of the companies who were getting paid for the credits went, you know what, we're getting paid too much. The regulator said, no, they're not. 
<laughs> no, they're not. They're, that's fine. Everything's working fine. So, yeah, not only have we got a hollowed out public service, there are parts of the public service that are actually running full cover for this greenwash, full denial. And then, of course, we've got the revolving door of people leaving the public service, leaving the regulator, and now working for the so-called, you know, green groups that are out there spruiking this stuff who used to be, you know, the regulator who was supposed to be on top of this. So yeah. there's, there's enormous governance problems here. Actually, that's a really good point. I think that the mandate has also been changed as well. So if you look at something like the Clean Energy Regulator, uh, it invites industry to help it co-design carbon credit methods. And um, the Department of Environment previously used to enter into, like, I'm sure that's where that prospectus came from, but enter into to partnerships and co-design. And so it's it's not as if it, we have sort of a, a skeleton public service that's still trying to do it the best it can. It, 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 the mandate is changed as well. So it's to serve industry or, or turn a blind eye or invite industry on what best environmental policy is. Mm. Uh, the next question that I've got is from uh, Brad Kilstra shown. I hope I've pronounced that correctly, Brad. Sorry if I haven't. Who says, Richard says credits are fine, sort of, but it's the use of credits as an offset that is the issue. However, isn't having a market for credits an integral part of having the credits in the first place, he asks. Hmm. Credits without an offset market would be worth nothing and be of no value. Is that correct? Or does the government have a fund to pay for credits with, yeah. which aren't used to offset yeah. anything? No, great question. Um, so the credits that we've had to date, have nearly all been purchased by the government through the so-called emission reduction fund. So you're spot on with, without a polluter who wants to pay for some greenwashing, uh, why would anyone buy the credits? And the answer is because we had a Commonwealth fund that set up uh, that set up a payment mechanism for them. Now, when I said credits are fine, sort of, as Polly said, there's shorter routes to victory here. We could have taken that same emission reduction fund and gone and bought some land and planted some trees on it ourselves. We could have taken that money and gone and paid farmers to just do some good things and like any grant program, then check that they did it. But instead of doing the simple stuff, we used the emission reduction fund to create a kind of credit system to incentivize all this action. And that's why I said they're fine, sort of. But when it was the government paying for these credits, they might have wasted some money. But as long as something got sequestered, as long as something good happened, then no harm was done, even if some money was wasted. But the minute you create the market where it's the polluter that's creating the demand, the polluter that's paying for the offset. If we know that Santos is going to increase emissions by a ton, and we know they bought a ton of credits that was probably only worth a kilogram, then we just caused more climate change. So when the government was overpaying for the credits, we were wasting money. But when Santos and Woodside are paying for dodgy credits, we're causing climate causing change. Causing climate change. The other, that's excellent. That's such a good question. That's kind of nailed at this whole <laughs> webinar. I wish we'd started with that. Yeah, bring just, him on. Yeah. Uh, when, you, when you can make a profit from something, that's when things get rorted. So the, the whole premise, I'll keep it quick, of the emissions reduction fund where the government was buying these credits was that they were buying them on lowest cost abatement. So you had to try and sell your credits as cheaply as possible to the government. Now, it's really to run a good carbon credit project or run a good biodiversity project, there's high transaction costs. But if someone's saying to you, I'm not going to pay you that much, to keep your profit margins high, you're going to cut as many corners as you can uh, and do things as cheaply as possible so you're, it's still worth your while financially mm. in even generating those credits. So this is why sort of direct incentives would be much more efficient because you remove the the temptation uh, for rorting, which is the rule, not the exception, yeah. isn't it, when, yeah. when you have these sort of um, markets with, with no competition at all. And then, of course, you had people sweeping in, these carbon aggregators saying to landholders, we'll help set up your projects if we can take a cut of your credits and and some of the, the money that you get when you sell them. And and so the entire existence of, of the fund was instantly, it's amazing they didn't see it beforehand, possibly they did, is that it was just rife for rorting and 
and lack of outcomes. Yeah. Let me give you an example. Like I say, I'm, I want to plant some actual trees and water some actual trees and sequester some actual carbon in my trees. And Polly just wants to rely on some accounting tricks and some dodgy use of satellite imagery to prove that she saved a ton. We're both bidding in the same market. She's always going to win. So the problem with going down the credit approach is that you actually create an incentive to, to do the rorting because the rorters will win at the auction every time. Yeah. And again, you've got a regulator sitting there saying, everything's fine, everything's fine. Well, you know, the polluters just want the cheapest credits they can get and the emission reduction fund just wanted the cheapest credits they can get. So the lower the integrity, the cheaper they are. Cheaper they are, yeah. The next question that I've got, um, Polly, I think might go to you, and it's about Shell advertising a CO2 neutral petrol. <laughs> uh, I believe we've spoken about this recently. Your uh, mum said this question. <laughs> carbon neutral petrol, claiming carbon credits, meaning CO2 compensation uh, and there's other elements there that's getting a bit technical for me. But in Germany and France, governments have laws requiring company evidence to state how emissions are being actually reduced before being offset. And Chris says the ACCC advocates and their Teal MP uh, are advocating for similar here. Where are we at in Australia in terms of claims like that? Well, Shell and others should just come to Australia because if you make a claim of a carbon neutral petrol, the government will literally certify it uh, and say that you're a progressive climate leader. The ACCC has said that it is cracking down on greenwash. And and so just, just to, to step back, we have talked about this. Ampol makes a claim that it has a carbon neutral petrol uh, and it is certified by the Australian government. It, nominally, it has to say how it's reducing emissions or or. or sort of put something on on the government this government um, schemes website showing how it's reducing emissions and taking climate action and then showing the offsets that it's bought the ACCC has simultaneously said that it's cracking down on greenwash um, I think ad standards which is self-regulated in Australia have also said they're sort of going to be reviewing their their standards but someone made a complaint about Ampol's carbon neutral petrol to ad standards and ad standards said there was no problem. And that is in part because it was certified by the Australian government, which kind of leads me to ask the question. And, and I've written about this. And um, if you do a quick search for Ampol carbon neutral petrol, you might find it. But if the ACCC is as an arm of government and, and ASIC and APRA and other regulators saying they're cracking down on greenwash, they're one arm of government are they actually going to be able to adequately give advice or prosecute greenwashing if it's the government itself that's A, approving the projects <laughs> and, and approving the, the climate claims? Um, so I don't know, like, to be fair, ACCC is in the middle of its sort of its internet sweeps and, and, and this sort of reform. I don't know where they'll come out at the end, but to me it just seems really hard to see how there will be genuine appetite to go against mm. Like, how is the government going to go against itself when yeah. it's tackling greenwashing? And, and Polly's previously called this state-sanctioned greenwash, which I think is a really important concept. Uh, and to be clear, while ad standards in Australia gave that ad a tick of approval, uh, in the Netherlands, an almost identical ad was had to be withdrawn. So apparently climate science is different in Australia uh, or Northern Europe Either the climate science is different or our regulatory standards are. And I think it's obvious it's the latter. Um, I've got I've got a question here from someone who's talking about a really specific development at Toonda Harbour um, in Moreton Bay in southeast Queensland um, near internationally Ramsar listed wetlands uh, for a building of 3,600 units. And the corporation has said that they're going to offset the mudflats um, by building rock walls where birds can roost, bearing in mind that the mudflats um, walk or will concrete over are where the birds forage for foods and they're going to bury 29 hectares of feeding habitat and a bunch of other things. The question is what additional information can community groups or communities who are kind of trying to fight against this habitat destruction, like what can they bring to the table in submissions against these types of developments? It's an excellent question. Um, I, mean, I would just be looking for as many case studies as possible with, and there will be abundant, sadly, 
where developments have been allowed to go ahead and they out and on the basis that they offset and then there has been some perverse outcome um I don't know if that's it's an adequate response it's a really good question about what you can actually do on the ground which you do oh yeah look I, I don't know about the specifics but it raises all of the problems that Polly was alluding to before about specifically in the biodiversity market space you want diversity there's a hint in the name we're trying to get diversity so let's go up a level like imagine you were going to close down a school in a particular community but you were going to open another school nearby. There was some planning reason you had to move the school. You can imagine that some people would prefer the old school, stay where it is, and you can imagine that some people will be happy with the new school. There's no right answer there, but there's disruption simply closing a school here and opening one here. But at least you kind of know at the end the, the amount of schoolness is going to be similar. We're talking here about biodiversity. We're going to we're going to concrete over a part of the country and say, don't worry, I'm, I'm going to make some niceness over here. Have you talked to the birds about it? Oh, they'll be fine. You know, what, what about all the subsoil species that the birds feed on? Yeah, should be right. You know, what about as climate changes? Will the newly evolving bit of niceness that hasn't grown yet, are you sure it will grow in the way? Ah, oh, pretty much. Yeah. So the whole idea that we can kind of uh, destroy a part of a, a, a wilderness area or a, a valuable piece of ecology because we're going to fix up another bit is based on the idea that a cafe closing and a cafe opening are fine. A mm -hmm. school closing and a school opening is fine. But ecosystems don't work like don't, that. Well, it's not and, economic. And actually, this is a good point. Like you could... For biodiversity credits, um, did you say that was in Queensland? That yes, I don't, I don't know if they, have, they have credits. It might just be um, offsetting, but you can have a biodiversity credit that has a, a floor price, and I think they do in New South Wales. And you can say, right, koalas or or, or whatever that um, bird was. I'm sorry, I've forgotten. Like, is a bazillion dollars. So, a developer, if you want to develop, then you have to pay a bazillion dollars for this this bird or or koala credit by putting a price on anything you are saying we are at some point if someone has enough money we are willing for that species to go extinct, extinct. we're willing with someone can buy it so which is completely flawed like you can say koalas a gajillion t dollars at some point you might get some oh Elon Elon Musk. Musk. Yeah, I was gonna, that's what I was going to say and I was going to preface it with an adjective but you might get an individual like saying I've got a gajillion t dollars and I'm going to buy all the koala credit like I'm going to whatever it could happen. You could get a maniac who does that. This is where you naturally need regulation. So I know this doesn't help this in this instance, but the fact that something has a price on it means it can be bought. And yeah. there's some things that you you need to be aware of if you're putting a price on them. It reminds me, it's not the same thing because it's not habitat destruction, but just speaking of ecosystems, when I worked in the Senate for a little while, I remember one time um, Parliament House decided to poison all the bogong moths because they used to really flock that to was, Parliament House. In summer. <laughs> so they, they poisoned all the bogong moths that were annoying people, but then all the birds started dying because, of course, all the birds ate all the bogong moths. Why are you laughing? Um, I, it was <laughs> hideous, but yeah. it's just like it's the kind of blinkered thinking it is, that though. I guess yeah, you don't that know. you so get. There, yeah. that, that question said that we've, it's protecting the roosting area but paving over the mudflats where they forage. Where they this eat. is all intrinsically yeah. interconnected and again yeah. biodiversity market we want diversity and and to put a value on each particular bit of it yeah it misses the point yeah uh the next question is from ian kruger who says with carbon credits as bad as they are what happens when this area of trees is burned down in a bushfire we have the original offset carbon plus the released sequestered carbon mm -hmm. is that a thing that happens mm. Yes, mm. it is. And it go, it's broader than carbon credits. So for our Australian government, it, while we've said emissions have only dropped by 1.8% since in the last year, since 2005, the Australian mm. government will tell you actually they've dropped about 20%. And that's because we have increased because of rain, not we have, sorry, rain increased forest cover. Um, and so our emissions accounts look a lot better than, than they actually are. And the reason why I bring that up is because what happens when we have 
catastrophic bushfires and flooding that knocks all those trees down in Australia? What do our emissions accounts look like there? In the in the very in the case of carbon credits, theoretically, if you have a carbon project that has um, planted trees or preserved trees and then it burns down, uh, you are you are liable. So you you have to pay the money back or, or you somehow liable, but it's an excellent question because Ampol or Origin or, or whoever Energy Australia has still emitted that ton. You can't you can't then say to Energy Australia, can you please pay that back? And it doesn't have to be fire. Uh, research by independent academics and and the Australia Institute has shown that you know a good two thirds of carbon credits in Australia are don't represent real reductions, mm. but they haven't just been bought by government. They've been bought by gas and coal and and com- companies and retailers to justify emitting CO2 into the atmosphere. If they're not real, and, and Ampol and Origin Energy uh, are among those, if they're not real, if this review finds, confirms that they're not real, it's too late. The mm-hmm. damage has already been done. It's, it's, a, the, it's, it's already got extra. It's already up there. Yeah. 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 So to be clear, even if someone repaid the money mm. because there was bushfire, even if the rules were enforced and there's no evidence that they are, paying back some money doesn't help. Yeah. Like we're not actually Fixing trying to balance the, the budget here. We're trying to actually tackle climate change. So yeah, when it when it rains and trees grow, we're like, hooray, we're tackling climate change. And when there's an enormous bushfire, it's like, yeah, that's don't the, count that. Act, Which we, yeah, we yeah, don't actually. You know, act of God, nature, don't worry so much about that. This is why we actually have to decarbonize the economy. And I guess I should have made this point sooner. I think if you wanted to summarize my concerns overall with this, the more effort and time we spend talking about offsets, the less we're decarbonizing the economy. Right. What we actually in need real to do, terms, yeah. What we actually need to do is burn less fossil fuels. This is not complicated. We've been telling ourselves this for thirty years, and now when we're kind of getting close to sort of all the deadlines, everyone's like, "Ah, oh, let me just shift the conversation away from why we need to burn less coal, why we need to burn less gas, why we need to burn less coal uh, uh, oil." No, no, it's okay. So every million dollars we spend buying an offset is a million dollars we didn't spend installing a solar panel. And until we kind of, again, we've got to strip away all the econobabble, we're now spending a fortune covering up our green, our greenhouse gas emissions yep. when we're supposed to be spending a fortune Reducing actually them. decarbonizing our economy. And, and just to be clear, um, that doesn't mean we don't protect those trees. It doesn't mean we don't Mm. grow new trees. It doesn't mean we don't restore ecosystems. Absolutely, that should be happening. If the private sector is willing to pay for it uh, with no return, which is highly unlikely, then that is very welcome too. Like it it has to be done uh, in conjunction with Got to do both. Fossil fuels. Yeah. Um, I'm afraid that's all we've got time for. Oh. Thank you so much. We had about uh, north of 550 people on the line with us today. Thank you so much for your interest. I'm sure this won't be the last time we touch on this topic. There's a review underway. There's a bunch of other work coming down the pipeline and uh, this isn't an issue that's going to be resolved anytime soon. We had a couple of questions about fossil fuel subsidies and other things. The Australia Institute obviously does a lot of work around the scale of fossil fuel subsidies in Australia. So we'll be looking at that in future as well. Um, And thank you all for your interest and questions today. Uh, It is a kind of a complicated thing to talk about. So we really appreciate you taking an interest in all your fantastic questions. Thanks to Richard and Polly. Thank you to all of you for joining us. This has been a special summer series episode of Follow the Money. All our webinars are free and available on the Australia Institute's YouTube channel at australiainstitute.tv. All our latest research and content is at australiainstitute.org.au and we're on Twitter at the Oz Institute with an A-U-S. My Twitter handle is ebony underscore Bennett with a double N double T. Richard Dennis is at R-D-N-S underscore T-A-I and Polly Hemming is at Polly J Hemming. Our podcast producer is at Jennifer Macy and our theme music is by Jonathan McFeet from Pulse and Thrum with additional music from Blue Dot Sessions. Thanks for listening.